tidbit. VOA1, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today, John Russell tells us how and why the year 2023 was a record-setting year for wind energy projects. Anna Mateo and Andrew Smith bring us this week's health and lifestyle report. Finally, we hear the lesson of the day from Jill Robbins and Andrew Smith. But first... A new report suggests that the world had its biggest year for new wind power projects in 2023. The Global Wind Report, published recently by the Global Wind Energy Council, or GWEC, a trade group, said the world developed 117 gigawatts of new wind power capacity, a 50% increase from 2022. The report explores the state of the global wind industry and the difficulties it is facing in its growth. The increase in wind power shows that the world is moving in the right direction in combating climate change, the report said. But the report's writers warned that the wind industry must increase its yearly growth to at least 320 gigawatts by 2030. That growth would meet terms of the International Climate Agreement, COP28. The deal demands the development of three times more renewable energy generation capacity by 2030. In addition, the agreement aims to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. It's great to see wind industry growth picking up, and we are proud of reaching a new annual record, said GWEC CEO Ben Backwell. George Aluru is with the Electricity Sector Association of Kenya. The industry group represents private investors in electricity. Aluru said the report shows that wind is becoming better understood around the world for, in his words, the value it brings as a renewable energy source. Renewable energy, including wind power, is considered an important tool for reducing climate change risk. Renewables are the least costly form of electricity in many parts of the world. The world's total wind power capacity is around 1,020 gigawatts. As was the case in 2022, China led all other countries for new wind power stations in 2023, with 65% of new operations. The United States came in second, followed by Brazil and Germany. These four countries represent 77% of new wind power capacity worldwide last year. The top five markets at the end of last year were China, the U.S., Germany, India, and Spain. Still, some other countries and areas are coming up the wind energy list, having witnessed record levels of growth in 2023. Africa and the Middle East established nearly one gigawatt of wind power capacity in 2023, almost three times more than the year before. With upcoming projects in South Africa, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia, the report predicts that new onshore wind additions for Africa and the Middle East will grow five times by 2028 
compared with 2023. Some of the markets to watch include Kenya, where wind power provides around 17% of electricity, the report said. The country has the largest wind farm in Africa, the 310-megawatt Lake Turkana Wind Power Project. I'm John Russell. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health and Lifestyle Report. For people who garden, April is an important month. Whether you live in the northern or southern hemisphere, weather and growing conditions change greatly in this time of year. In the northern hemisphere, the weather generally is beginning to warm up. And in the southern hemisphere, the weather is generally beginning to cool down. So gardening may look different in these two regions. Today we give some general tips for working in an April garden, whichever hemisphere you might live in. The website Sustainable Gardening Australia gives suggestions on gardening in parts of the Southern Hemisphere. At this time of year, weeding is important. If left unchecked, weeds can take space, water, sunlight, and nutrients from growing plants. Mulching is also important and will help control weed growth. The website suggests mulching after watering to a depth of about 7 centimeters and warns to keep the mulch away from baby plant stems. At this time of year, experts say to water first thing in the morning. And instead of quick daily waterings, longer watering two times a week might be more helpful. What you plant depends on your climate. So you need to check which plants grow at this time of the year in your zone or area. In cooler areas, experts on the website Sustainable Gardening Australia suggest planting Chinese cabbage, most Asian greens, spinach, rocket, broccoli, spring onions, asparagus, celery, endive, squash, onions, leeks, and lettuce. Many herbs are suitable to plant at this time of year, such as parsley, basil, rosemary, thyme, and mint. However, keep an eye on mint, as it can quickly take over. Also, in cooler areas, planting potatoes could work well. In most parts of the Northern Hemisphere, things are coming to life in April. Trees, shrubs, perennials, and other plants enter a new phase of life in gardens. Garden insects do the same. People who garden are also waking from a kind of dormancy, a state of rest, in spring. Now is the time for preparation. Jessica Damiano writes about gardening for the Associated Press. She advises gardeners to get ready. It's showtime, she writes, of spring gardening. Damiano suggests that the first step is to inspect your garden. Remove fallen tree branches you find. Remove dead wood from trees. For pruning, she advises using a sharp pruning saw to make clean cuts on the diagonal, just outside the branch collar. This is the area where the branch meets the trunk. 
If the damage is within reach, she advises to do it yourself. But for anything higher than your head, she suggests using a tree cutting expert. She says to prune shrubs too, except for spring bloomers. Those should be pruned right after their flowers die. What about cleaning up? Some people favor a tidy garden. But Damiano says gardeners should wait on removing dead plants and leaves if the ground temperature is still cool. Helpful insects, including pollinators, may be resting among these remains. She notes that the insects react to temperatures and weather, not the calendar. Her suggestion is to avoid cleaning the garden until the insects are ready. Damiano waits until nighttime temperatures have remained above 10 degrees Celsius for an entire week before cutting down last year's dead plants. This makes way for new growth, while at the same time helps helpful insects survive. She says there is some disagreement among experts about this timing because different species arise at different temperatures. But she finds waiting for warmer weather protects many insects while still permitting her to work in her garden. Damiano also says gardeners should not mulch their beds until the soil has warmed. Using mulch too early can trap cooler temperatures in the soil. This could delay root awakenings. Instead, mulch when tomatoes are planted in your area. In Damiano's New York Garden, that means late May. If you have a grass lawn, check for dead spots. Seed those areas once a week. Water twice a day until new growth meets the existing grass height. Do not let the seeds dry or you may have to start over. You can cut seeded lawns when the grass is just under 8 centimeters tall. Damiano suggests pulling weeds as soon as you see them. At this time of the year, the roots should be easy to remove. And avoid walking on wet soil. This could damage underground plant structures. Plants have a hard time recovering from such damage. When flowering bulbs lose color, apply a balanced fertilizer, such as a 10-10-10 product. This type of fertilizer contains equal parts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. As it contains all three nutrients, it usually works for most plants. But do not remove leaves until they turn yellow. The plants need them to produce energy for next year's bloom. Damiano gives established perennials fertilizer as soon as they come out. She likes to use fertilizer made from fish parts. Her final advice is to plant new perennials before the summer heat sets in. They may need six full weeks of growth. However, if you live in a part of the northern hemisphere where spring frosts are possible, do not plant annuals yet. No matter where you live in the world, there is always something for a gardener to do. Doing some of these gardening jobs in April can help set up a healthy garden for the developing season. And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Ana Mateo. 
And I'm Andrew Smith. Ana Mateo is here now to talk more about this week's Health and Lifestyle Report. Hi, Ana. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me to your show, Ashley. This week, you explained the tasks people should be doing right now in both the Southern and Northern Hemisphere to prepare their gardens. That's right. I found Jessica Damiano's story in the Associated Press very interesting. But she focused just on gardening in the Northern Hemisphere. As our listeners are all over the world, I added some April gardening tips for the Southern Hemisphere as well. What are some of the differences? Well, in many parts of the Northern Hemisphere, the weather is warming up. So people who garden may want to start cleaning their gardens right away. But they might want to wait until ground temperatures warm up a little more. Helpful insects may still be hibernating in overgrown areas of the garden. So I imagine different things are being planted. In both hemispheres, what you plant depends on your climate. That's right. First, you need to check which plants grow at this time of the year in your zone or area. Generally speaking, in many areas of the Southern Hemisphere, you could start planting things like Chinese cabbage, Asian greens, lettuce, endive, and spinach, as well as broccoli, spring onions, asparagus, and celery. And you can also plant many herbs this time of year. How about the Northern Hemisphere? Well, as I said earlier, in most parts of the Northern Hemisphere, in April, things are just starting to come to life. People who garden may also be waking from a kind of dormancy, a state of rest, in springtime. So now is the time to prepare and plan your garden. Well, thanks for answering those questions, Anna, and thanks for that helpful report. Thanks for having me, Ashley. is Anna Mateo. My name is Andrew Smith. And I'm Jill Robbins. You're listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English podcast. Welcome to the part of the show where we help you do more with our series, Let's Learn English. The series shows Anna Mateo in her work and life in Washington, D.C., Anna feels lucky to be in Washington because many special events take place in the city. In a previous lesson of the day, we followed Anna as she visited a festival for the famous English playwright William Shakespeare. And in today's lesson, Anna goes to another festival. This time, in Lesson 24 of the Let's Learn English series, Anna goes to a Folklife Festival. A festival is a special program of events that usually celebrates a particular topic. For example, a festival might celebrate traditions connected to a national holiday or the culture of a particular nationality. Or festivals might celebrate topics such as books, old cars, or a particular style of music. Festivals often take place outdoors in public places. Folk life refers to traditional aspects of a culture, such as music, dance, clothing, and food, that have lasted for several generations. And the word folk simply means people. But Jill, you know what? I think we have digressed away from Anna. <laughs> yes, I think we have. 
To digress means to start talking about things less closely related to the main topic. So let's come back to Anna and the Folk Life Festival. The official name of the event is the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival. The Smithsonian is a large group of museums, education, and research centers created by the U.S. government. Now let's listen to Anna in Lesson 24. I was at work, and I wanted a break. So I walked and walked and walked and walked. Then I saw something. It was a festival, a big festival. It's the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival. Yes, it was the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival. Every year, the festival shows different cultures. This year, one of the cultures was the Basque culture. There was dancing and food and games. I am dancing a traditional Basque dance. <laughs> At the festival, I danced a traditional Basque dance. <laughs> they are cooking traditional Basque food. They cooked a lot of traditional Basque food. Nice shot. They are playing a game. It's a kind of handball. What do they call it? They call it pilota. Hold it. They played a game with their hands and a small ball. It's a kind of handball, but this game is called pilota. Anna learned new things about Basque culture. Basque refers to a region and culture in the northeastern part of Spain. There, the people speak both Spanish and the Basque language. Andrew, our listeners might be interested to know that even though the Basque language is spoken by people in Europe, the language is not related to other European languages. In fact, linguists, which means people who study languages, think the Basque language is older than the other languages in Europe. That means people have been speaking Basque for a very long time. Let's look at how Anna asked about the handball game they were playing. She didn't know the name of the game. When we don't know the name of something, we usually use the verb call to ask about it. Listen. What do they call it? They call it pilota. This is a very useful expression in English. Although we sometimes say, what is the name of that place? For a particular place, such as a restaurant. For many other things, we say, what do you call it? Or, what is that called? What is this called? So, if you are learning English and you don't know the name of an object or an activity, you can just say, what do you call this? And the answer uses the passive form of the verb, is called. Listen. It's a kind of handball, but this game is called pilota. I'm Andrew Smith, and you're listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English podcast. In the lesson of the day, we like to give examples of how native speakers pronounce phrases when they are speaking quickly. What do you call it? Sounds like this when we say it quickly. What do you call it? We change the three words, what do you, to what do you, when we speak quickly. What do you means what do you. And our listeners should also notice that we don't really pronounce the letter T at the end of the phrase. Instead of saying call it, we say call it with a held T. We talked about the held T in a previous lesson of the day when we compared the pronunciation of the verb can and its negative form, can't. Now, 
Listen to Jill and me give more examples of fast speech with the verb call. Ready? Listen. What is this called? What is that called? What is it called? What do you call it? Let's look closely at one of those sentences. Speaking slowly, I can say, What is it called? But when I speak quickly, it changes to, What is it called? What is becomes reduced to, What is? The letter T in what changes to a sound closer to the letter D. And the word it goes by so fast that it becomes very reduced to just a vowel sound plus a very fast held T. It, it, it. What is it? What is it? What is it? What is it called? We sometimes use the phrase, what do you call, to make jokes. For example, what do you call a police officer in bed? A police officer in bed? Uh, I don't know. What do you call a police officer in bed? An undercover cop. Ha! Huh. That's pretty good. When you're under the covers, you are lying under blankets in bed. And cop is a short word for police officer. Here's one for you, Jill. What do you call something that goes up when the rain comes down? Mm, an umbrella? You got it. You're pretty good at this. Hey, thanks. There's another detail from Lesson 24 of the Let's Learn English series we should mention. When we use the simple past of regular verbs in English, we pronounce the ED ending three different ways depending on the spelling of the verb. We can hear Anna use the three different pronunciations. Yesterday started like a usual work day. I was at work and I wanted a break. So I walked and walked and walked and walked. They played a game with their hands and a small ball. It's a kind of handball, but this game is called pilota. With the first examples, the verbs started and wanted, you can hear the extra syllable id. Started, wanted. We add this extra syllable when the verb ends in the letter t or d. With the verb walked, you can hear the sound of the letter t. Walked. We add the T sound when the verb ends in a voiceless consonant, like the letters K and P. Worked. Stopped. And the third way we pronounce is with the sound of the letter D. Played. Called. We add this when the verb ends with a voiced sound like a vowel or like the letter V. Loved. Let's listen to Anna use the three different pronunciations one more time. Yesterday started like a usual work day. I was at work and I wanted a break. So I walked and walked and walked and walked. They played a game with their hands and a small ball. It's a kind of handball, but this game is called pilota. Jill. What do you call a podcast that has run out of time? Mm. Overcast. Ah, uh, ha, you mean it's cloudy? No, you know, as in the lesson is over. Oh, it's over. Ha, <laughs> well, time flies when you're having fun. You can learn more on our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. You can also find us on YouTube. Facebook, and Instagram. And thanks for listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English Podcast. I'm Jill Robbins. And I'm Andrew Smith. And that's our program for today. 
Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 